good morning and welcome to Plymouth United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We are an open and affirming congregation, a just peace church, an anti-racist church, and we strive to live that out each and every day. And we are so grateful to come together on this morning to worship God and to worship with one another. And if this is your first time worshiping with us at Plymouth United Church of Christ, we welcome you. And if this is your church home, we welcome you. Below in the comments, you will see a link to our church website where we would love you to go and let us know that uh, you worshiped with us this morning and share a little information about yourselves. And you can also find out all about the different ways that you can get involved in the life of our congregation. Well, this morning, um, I am continuing uh, my vacation and I've pre-recorded all of these bits of our worship service, but I, I just wanted to remind you that if you have any pastoral support needs during this time, you can call the church office or look at our weekly email for the Reverend Dick Sherlock's um, phone number that you can reach him at. He is providing pastoral coverage during my vacation time. Well, and this morning we also continue in our series on being the church because we know that the church is not a building. The church is the work of the people, the collective movement and the following in the ways of Jesus. And so this morning you will be blessed uh, to hear the Reverend Dick Sherlock as he is preaching as well as presiding over communion. If you haven't already, um, remember to gather your bread and juice or whatever elements that you have available. Substitutions are A-OK -okay in our tradition. Um, and so you can be prepared for that um, following the sermon. And so as we turn from the business of our lives and the business of the church, whatever it is that you bring with you this day, a hunger for justice, thirst for peace. Know that our God meets us here, wherever we are, providing us a space for healing and hope. And here are these words of opening prayer. Generously, lavishly, abundantly, God spreads seeds of holy possibility far and wide. And who will nurture their potential? Who will tend to their growth? The spirit of life cries out for cooperation. May all who long for God join in the labor of liberation. That love may blossom. That justice may be a bountiful crop. That courage may grow unencumbered. Let not the gifts of God be wasted, but the harvest be plenty. Let the divine life flourish among us. Amen.
Isaiah 55, 10 to 13. As for the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I propose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. verses 1 through 19, or excuse me, 1 through 9 and 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of a soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on the good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. And then he explained the parable. Hear then the parable of the soil. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, 
the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no work, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what has sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares of the word, world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, and in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and another thirty. Good morning. Thank you for taking me into your home again. Uh, it's my privilege to offer a sermon and a little bit of worship leadership this morning. So let's begin this time uh, with a little prayer. Would you pray with me? Oh, Spirit, invade our hearts and our minds, invade our words and our thoughts. Do it in a way that opens our eyes to see those things we've never seen before, to hear in a way that we've never heard before. Open those minds so we can imagine like we've never done before. But, O oh Spirit, our hearts, set them on fire. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we have two scripture lessons, uh, and they fit together nicely, even though they technically have nothing to do with each other, okay? Um, the first one, though, I'm, I'd, I'd like to talk with you about is that lesson from the gospel. It's a wonderful example of Jesus teaching in a parable. Now, please remember that what a parable is, it's a story that everybody can relate to. It, it has common things that everybody has been a part of or, or knows what, how to do, things like that. So obviously, this is a parable about planting seeds, okay? It's a good, uh, it's a good vehicle to uh, get people to come in together and to think along the same lines. The thing that's unusual about this particular parable, you aren't going to find many of them in this or any other of the Gospels, is that Jesus not only tells us the parable of the sower and the seeds, then he explains it to us. Now, for those of us who are preachers, you might think that we don't exactly find that to be very helpful because it means that we can't use our imaginations, but let's do that. But what I want to talk about today is the explanation of the parable. Let's talk about the sowing, the planting, you know, the, 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 the ground and the sustenance, the rain, and all those kinds of things. Let's talk about all that. And let's talk about it in a way that you and I maybe can, can get into. For me, you know what it is? I plant flowers, but I don't plant them just any place. I plant them in pots, and I put them in various places around our, our, our house. Now, I started doing this a number of years ago, and it's become important to me that, first of all, the flowers live. First few years, they didn't, but now I've learned all kinds of things about it. But you know one thing? that I have found very useful. So I'm passing this on to you about planting flowers, okay? I'm sure you probably know it. When you use the potting soil, get miracle Grow. It's good stuff. I mean, it has so much plant food in it that the, the plants, you almost can't kill them if you keep watering them. It's just wonderful stuff. miracle Grow is good soil, and that's what's talked about in Jesus' parable the good soil. It has nutrients. It can sustain things that are trying to live in it. It's what it needs, and it, ha it has room to grow and everything like that. So that's, now, miracle grow is not in the parable, but as you saw from the title of the sermon, I thought we'd talk about that too. Well, let's look at the explanation 
of the parable in verses 18 through 23. But first of all, let's agree on some of the important terms, okay? Now, we find out when we read the parable that the seeds that are being sown are called the, the words of the kingdom. Now, let's not let that get in our way, okay? The words of the kingdom are the teachings for us of Jesus. It's the message that's being conveyed that we understand to be a godly message, one from Christ, one that has to do with our faith and our faithfulness, okay? So that's the seeds that we're talking about falling in the right kind or the wrong kind of ground and growing, okay? Now, the other terms that are going to be important for us are the path. Now, all of us can relate to that, even if we've never gone out in the woods to find a path. A sidewalk is a path. Heck, the, 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 the space between our furniture is a path in our houses. So a path is a way, a way that we're going to go, okay? We're going to use that word, rocky ground. <laughs> if you lived out here at my house in Lowell, you'd know all about rocky ground. You cannot dig a hole in my yard without having more rocks than you have soil. But rocky ground makes it hard to dig, but it also makes it hard for some kinds of plants to grow, doesn't it? Because the roots can't go out, they have to go out around the rocks and everything like that. If, there's, if the rock is too big, it can't go through it. So rocky ground is not a great thing to plant in. Now, the thorns. If you've been out in the woods like I have so much during my life with my dogs and everything, you'll know there's thorns everywhere. There just are. Most of them are really long uh, vines and they have thorns. You cannot escape them. You have to wear the right kind of clothing. And no matter what, you're going to come home with lots of cuts on your hands and your ankles and things like that. So thorns are nasty things, okay? When we talk about thorny uh, ground. It's nasty stuff, okay? But then there's good soil. And whenever this parable talks about good soil, it's the kind that produces fruit, abundant fruit, okay? So now when we uh, talk about that, um, we're the hearers of the parable, okay? Now, we aren't the disciples, no, we're the people that are at the shore listening to Jesus out in the boat. We don't have any qualifications. We're just hearing. He's speaking to us. He's teaching us in our imperfections, in our strengths, our weaknesses. He's speaking to us when we hear this parable. So we are the hearers. We aren't necessarily the soil or the seeds, but maybe, maybe. we got to get into this, don't we? Okay. Now, I think that we are kind of the seeds too. We aren't just the hearers. If we're gonna take part in this parable, we're gonna take part as the seeds, but we're gonna take part as the soil. We're of the soil. You know, we, we are stewards of, of what sustains in life, of what gives life, of what makes life wonderful and abundant. So we're all different parts of this parable, but we're also the ones to whom Jesus is speaking. Now, if you want to take and look, if you have your Bible with you, in those verses uh, 18 through 23, and it's going to talk about what the parable means. But first of all, it talks about if, if they fall on the path. Now, paths are usually pretty worn, aren't they? They're, they're beaten down, at least it's the same thing all the time. And it says what it is, that if it falls on the path, that's for, that means that you didn't understand. And so the evil one comes and takes the seed away and it doesn't grow at all. I don't know about you, but I, must, I think I've spent an awful lot of my faith life on that path, confused, not understanding things. So yeah, we, we're there, aren't we? Yeah, sometimes. The rocky ground, isn't it interesting how that's talked about? The rocky ground is kind of like what, what I call comfortable Christianity, okay? Or, or feel good faith. It's the kind where, boy, you know, it sounds great and I'm gonna spout off all the words about and everything like that. But the first time 
it asks me to do something that's difficult. The first time it asks me to abstain from something that I like. The first time it costs me. Eh, that's not for me. It's not convenient. That's the, that's the kind of seed that falls on the rocky ground. It doesn't get any roots. It just can't grow and flourish. The thorns, it says here in the scripture, uh, I, I'm not sure I understand exactly what it means, but it's the cares of the world, the lure of wealth, everything like that. You know, let, let's be honest. We all know what that means, that uh, being faithful is second to family sometimes, to our job, to our education to having fun, all those kinds of things. And it can mean that our faith isn't going to grow very much if the things that are the most important to us, the things that we have decided nurture us the most, are those kinds of things. Those are the thorns in the parable. And then, of course, we get down to the good soil. It bears fruit. What does that mean for us? How we got, because let's face it, we want to find the good soil, don't we? We want to be living in the good soil. Well, how do we know it's there? The only thing we know from the parable is it bears fruit. Well, what's the fruit for a Christian living out her or his faith? I think it's only one thing. It takes so many forms, but it's only one thing. It's Christian love self-giving love, the giving of oneself so another might live, and another might live and, and, and live into abundant life that we then share together in that love. That's the fruit that comes from a good soil. Okay, well, that's a lot of words. I'm, I'm sorry, but I've been doing a lot of talking, but what is the point. Is all we're supposed to do to read this parable and decide which of those soils we're living in? Well, don't, you can do that. Go ahead and do that. If you want to look at your life the way it is right now and try to use the analogy of the soil, you know, are you on the path that is just too ordinary and you don't understand it, you haven't taken the time to figure it out? Are you on the rocky ground where you don't have any roots? Are you in the thorny thing where other things are way more important to you than your faith? You can do that. It might be useful to you, but I would suggest it might be a waste of time because let's face it, every one of us, as we've lived some years of our lives, have been on every one of those paths. Why, I think of myself, I think, on one given day, I might be in all four of them. Really, don't you think? So this isn't a thing that's asking us to look for a perfect life where we don't have any problems with being faithful or anything like that. Um, faithfulness and fruits that we are bearing have to do with the good soil. If we're gonna use this analogy of the sower and the seeds, we're always going to want to be the good in the good soil, aren't we? Well, I don't want to worry about when I'm in the other parts. I want to know how to get in the good soil, how to be a part of that, and how to find it. You know what? I think that that's where the prophet Isaiah comes to help us. That was a, did you, didn't you just love the poetry of those words about, and the, the imagery of rain coming from God down in heaven? And it doesn't come right back. It doesn't come back until it's nurtured things. It's watered everything and everything's growing and producing abundance. It's actually, this, these words of Isaiah have the exodus in mind, where people are leaving one place and they're going to be rooted in a new place and grow and thrive and everything like that. And so they, they, they can sing and they come in like that. And then when they, they've got to go on, they can do it in peace. Wow. It, it's just a, a wonderful light. But that's where, when the prophet helps us trying to figure out this parable and our place in faithfulness, are we in the good soil? What's the good soil like? The, the words of the kingdom, the kernels that are being given to us to plant, 
I want us to think about those. That's kind of like the voice that's in us. It's in us and it's trying to get ourselves to move outside of ourselves, okay? It's impelling us out to others. It's, it's telling us to give ourselves to others, but do it in a way that there's growth, there's fruit, and that's called love. And let's talk about what that takes. How, how, what, are the, what are the signs that that's the kind of soil that we've chosen to live in? Well, it takes a certain kind of fertilizer, okay? And that's where the miracle growth comes in because I think that it's not a job for us as individuals, okay? This message about being sowers in the seeds and giving life and growth and stuff like that, if I think that's just my job and I've got to do it on my own, I'm going to really burn out pretty quick. I am because I only have so much. I really do. I don't know if you if you understand what I'm saying, but I think it's, it's probably true about yourself too. What if, what if you aren't feeling too well? What if you've got a, a pre-existing condition this time of COVID and you can't even go out of your house? How are you gonna do this? But even more so, how much love does any one person have that they can give of themselves to another and give that person all the new life they might need. I don't know. I think therefore that just as Isaiah's message is always to the people in the plural, that's the way all the prophets spoke. So was Jesus speaking to the people he's calling to follow him. He's not thinking of each of those individuals. He's thinking about all of them together adopting this way of life, all of them giving of themselves so another might live. So how do we do that? What kind of soil must we be a part of to make that happen? There's some necessary aspects to that soil if we're gonna have it. First of all, it takes that word commitment. Commitment to something outside of ourselves. Commitment to a love that's costly. And so it means our commitment is to living our lives generously. Yes, generously because the cost is going to be real. It's going to cost us time. It's going to cost us talent. It's going to cost us money. It's going to cost us disappointment and failure and all kinds of things. We, if, if we don't have that kind of commitment, then we're going to be rocky ground or we're going to be thorny ground or we're going to be that path where we just don't get it to begin with. There's something else that the soil needs that love. It's patience. And boy, that's something I'm not very good at. Are you? Patience. But you know what patience is really good for? Patience is good to the, for developing humility. Yeah, humility. That this isn't about me. It's about the other's life and what I might be able to enable them to be and to have and where I may enable them to go. And then if they go and leave me behind, that's the, that's, wow, that's really something. So I got to be humble. I don't necessarily want any credit for this. You see, so humility, so commitment, generosity, patience, humility, all those things enable you to really have a lot of forgiveness, to ask for it, to receive it, but also to offer it and really to give it away too. Humility is perhaps the most important part of this. Now, we're talking about the love, aren't we? That's the good soil. We're talking about how we together, working together as a faithful community. Oh, I said the word. There's the other aspect of the good soil. A faith community is the good soil. A faith community where all of us, each in our own way, but all of us together, our giving of ourselves so others might live. So 
we have to love each other. Yeah, the giving might not go much past each other if the need is right there. Think about that. The true abundance of Christian faithfulness, the true abundance of self-giving love is it only finally is there when those who are receiving the acts of love can rejoice in being a part of that crazy abundant love, life-giving love, just as much and alongside of, just as much as and alongside of those who are able to give the love. I want you to remember that, that it's relationship love. It's me giving of myself so another might live. It's them receiving that love and the growing in life because of it. And it's me being a part of that still. It's me receiving their love when I need their love, when I take from them and I become more or I'm more peaceful. Because you see, it's a symbiosis. So this Christian love, let me say it again, is truly abundant. When those receiving love at any given point in their lives can rejoice in being a part of God's powerful creation, God's and Christ's powerful love in company with those who at that point are the ones who are the giving of the love. So think of what that means for us as a Christian community. Let me make some suggestions. If someday you visit me on my deathbed, I want to be able to enjoy the love we're sharing even then. I want us to both be able to say it out loud, sing and dance, or just rejoice of the love even then we are sharing. Because I have a lot to give, because we have so much to share together. I don't know about you, but that kind of an idea, not about my deathbed, but the sharing of love is the only thing that I can imagine myself committing myself to. And I can't do that without you. Now, I want, let's, let's talk more about how this love plays out when we do it as a church, as a Christian community. When you feed me because I'm hungry, when you clothe me because I'm naked, when you teach me because I don't know, I want to rejoice with you in the empowering love that we are both enveloped by, the empowering love that's enabling me to grow and become one with you and then go on and we together move forward. Not because I'm needy, but because I'm loved and because I'm invited to be a part of that love not just a recipient. This is getting hard. That love, that Christian love, the community of faith, like we want to be, can generate, is when we work together to rid our church, our neighborhoods, our cities, and our very country of that white racism, which has had 400 years of its own growth, that rocky road, that thorny reality for so many persons of color. I want to hurt. I want to cry together. I want to imagine and sing and dance and to celebrate together the love we are immersing ourselves in, in ridding our world of racism. So what is it that this, these scriptures can invite us into today? No, I'm not going to think that this is a farmer analogy. Now we're all farmers. No, no, no. But it says that we, the people of faith, in living out our faithfulness, are going to be producing an abundant crop of life through love, through commitment, through work, through persistence, through the giving of ourselves so others might live. And so you see, if we try to think about this, just one last time, let's think about this parable. We're the seeds, 
we're the sowers, we're the soil, we're the rain, and we can do this. We can make this vision that Isaiah put into those beautiful words real. We can do it even in our frailty, we can do it. For in the giving of ourselves so others might live to each other and to every other, we have joined together in that power and that spirit of God that we know in Christ, which reigns on our world, on us, enabling us to go out in joy and to come back in peace. A new world, a new order, a new people. Those with ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen. When we can join together in communion, even though we must do it in this virtual way, we are becoming once again a part of a tradition, of an activity that has gone through centuries now. We're joined together with millions and millions of persons who have gone before us, with millions on this very day in the same activity. And we're also looking forward to the fact that millions after us will do the same thing. It's a simple thing, isn't it, this, this, this communion? When you think about it, a lot of the liturgies call it a meal. Well, it really isn't, let's face it, it's a little bit to drink and a little bit of bread. Now, if we were in jail, yeah, that might be a meal. But that's not the point of communion. We do this because we remember that our story says that the same night in which Jesus was betrayed by one of his own disciples, he chose to sit down for an evening meal with his disciples. Now, actually, this is a meal that he had, had many times with him before. Uh, da Vinci got it wrong, by the way. They would have had to be in Europe and the Enlightenment, and really quite rich to have that big long table. These were religious meals that they had had quite often, they're called Shabura in Hebrew. But what they were was somebody hosted the meal. They would come together and they know they were gonna talk over religious matters. There would be enough tables for everyone to sit around. The host, the tradition was the host at the beginning of the meal would take the big loaves of matzah and begin to break them up and pass them out so all the guests would have their matzah. Well, there was a traditional prayer that the host would always say over the bread. We even know the very words that Jesus said that night as the host of that last meal he was having with his disciples. But then Jesus that night added some words and that's why we're here today. He said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And he told his disciples that as often as they should meet to share that bread, they should do so to recall him. Ooh. Just for a second, imagine with me, would you? What were the conversations around those tables? See, in the, each, in the middle of each table is just a a bunch of stew and the matzo was used to pull the stew out and eat it. What were they, what did, he, did you hear what he said? His body broken for us? And that in the future we should do this to recall him? Oh, what, what is this about? This was last supper. Well, it was also the tradition in these meals that at the end of the meal before everybody left, the host would go over usually to a sideboard where the host would have placed the good wine. It was called the cup of blessing. The host would go over and get that cup, say a traditional prayer over it. Again, we know the exact prayer that Jesus said over that cup that evening. But then Jesus added the words, that night, 
and forever afterward. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and many, that sins might be forgiven and, of course, life lived anew. Wow. And then everyone would have drunk from the cup and left. So you see, the communion we share today and in the future, and we've shared now with millions through the centuries, isn't a meal. It's the beginning and the end of a meal that was called together by Christ. So at the beginning, we remember. We recall Christ. At the end, people leave in Christ. And so at the end, we recall Christ. So I hope you have your bread and your cup. Would you join me in prayer and pray with me? O Spirit of Christ, join with us now in our hearts and our minds and our apartness, bring us together that we might remember, we might recall, and we might become one again with Christ in our lives, in our faithfulness. Amen. We are told that after Jesus had broken the bread and passed it out, that he said, take eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, do so to recall me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the bread of life. Take, eat, and remember. And then, as again was the tradition in those times, as the host of the meal, Jesus went and got the cup of blessing. At the end of the meal, he said a blessing over it. But then he said to everybody gathered there, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and many, that sins might be forgiven and of course life lived anew. Once again, he asked his disciples as often as they should meet to share that cup, to do it in order to recall him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the cup of the new covenant. Take, drink, and recall him. Would you pray with me? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for everything we can be. True servants of humanity, loving you, loving each other, loving them faithfully. Thank you, thank you, oh Lord. Thank you for the simplicity of this sacrament for we intimately recall you into our lives, into our hearts and minds. We are reminded that you are the good soil from which we spring. Thank you for this, the ending of this sacrament, where we are reminded that we have been born again into a new life, freed from the old ways, a life of giving a life of love, a life that will never end. Thank you that we can go now from this time in the peace which passes all understanding. Amen.
beloveds, it's that time in our worship where we lift up the joys and the concerns that are upon our hearts. And I just wanted to remind you that if you have a prayer request that you would like me to share during worship or would like me to share with our prayer chain, please email me at pastor at PlymouthChurchGR.org. There are so many who are in need of our prayers those who are upon our hearts. And so in this moment of silence, I invite you to lift aloud or lift into your heart those who are in need of our prayers. We lift prayers for Irma Cornelius and her nephew, Paul Miller, and their family because Paul passed away. And so in celebration for his life, but as they grieve this loss in their family, we pray. Holy wisdom, as we journey through the valleys of death and over mountains of injustice, your truth is our sustenance and your presence our comfort. Though the struggles make us weary, keep us determined in love. We are ready, O oh God, to grow and to be transformed and you have provided us with all that we need to cultivate life and love in community. Even under harsh conditions, you come to us with gifts of care and compassion and courage, promising to multiply them among willing hearts. We bring all of who we are in gratitude as we pray that we may be faithful to one another and loyal to the calling of these days. May it be so. Amen. Beloveds, the power of community is one of God's greatest gifts to us. And this looks different for us in this time. And though it's together that we learn what love looks like and how it feels and what makes it possible. And so we can make mistakes together and we can try again. We support one another in joy and in grief. We create belonging in a world that can be so very isolating. And like last week, we learned about the Plymouth Pen Pals program. We are in the process of working on other opportunities for community and belonging through small groups, recognizing that it's in community that the needs of one another are the needs of all of us. And so we give thanks for the ways that the gifts of time and talent and treasure have been given in the mutual care responding to the needs of all. So check out this video on upcoming small groups.
beloveds, one way that we nurture divine life together is by sharing what we have. We turn from all that cuts life through greed and consumption. And we choose a better way than individualism and selfishness. In commitment to one another and to our neighbors, we nourish love through generosity and mutuality. And we can only continue to do Plymouth's mission through our collective faithfulness of time, talent, and treasure. And so we ask you to continue your faithfulness um, by staying um, current on your commitments of pledges or gifts to Plymouth United Church of Christ. And we give thanks for all of you who have continued to be faithful. You can also give electronically on our church website. And so we give thanks to you for your support. And beloveds, hear these words of benediction as we close. The way of God is the way of transformation. We need not be afraid that we don't yet understand. We need not grasp for control. We need not hide from the chaos of change. So in the spirit of humility, God calls us to open our hearts to the seeds of new life, that the harvest may be plenty. So let us go with courage and practice together the way of Christ. Amen. Thank you.